Good morning. All right, thank you, I appreciate that. Um, so I wanna get everyone involved. Uh, how many people are having a good time at State of the Map US? All right, very good. Uh, how many people are here for the first time at a State of the Map? Holy, that's like 50%, great. So welcome, um, another question. How many people here are active editors of OpenStreetMap? Like once a month, once a day? Okay, most of the people, some are not raising their hands, that's okay. If you have a, someone sitting next to you, you have a conversation after this. <laughs> Two more questions. Uh, of those people who are actively contributing, who uses imagery as they're making their edits? Okay. How many pe of people who just raised their hand, how many people know who Digital Globe is? Okay, okay. So. So several, good, all right, that gives me a feel of uh, who I'm talking to. Um, this is my fourth presentation at a state of the map, and in meeting a lot of you and knowing a lot of you, I know many of you are very technical, uh, very, lots of developers out there, lots of engineers, um, and so I've kept my presentations in the past very technical to try to uh, meet people's requirements, make sure everyone's happy. But what's funny is, invariably, during the Q&A, um, I get questions about non-technical stuff. So I compiled a list of FAQs. This is what people ask me about. Um, in fact, Philip asked me about this last night. What is your business model? I get the technical stuff. Tell me what you guys do. Who is Digital Globe? Uh, why are you licensing data? Why don't you just make it all open to everyone? And what the heck are small sats and are, are, is Digital Globe doing small sets. So what I thought I'd do today is preemptively hit all these FAQs um, so you don't have to ask them today. And also since this is being recorded, when people ask me, I can just give them the YouTube URL. and make my life a lot easier. <laughs> so through the use of emoji, I'll walk you through our business model. Um, Digital Globe is a publicly traded company on the New York Stock Exchange. So anyone's free to go spend $20 on a share of Digital Globe and be a part owner. Uh, if you have a retirement fund or mutual fund or 401k, you may already be an owner. So we're a public company, all our financials are open, uh, free and open on sec.gov. We raise money through these markets and through share owners to launch satellites into space. Um, we also build a ground system uh, around the world to download information and send commands up to our satellites. Uh, we then invest in computers and what we call factories to process all this data. We're collecting about 70 terabytes of data per day. And uh, is anyone here from AWS, Mark or Jed? All right, well they owe me lunch because we spend a lot of money with AWS. Um, we have about 80 petabytes plus of, of archive data sitting in the cloud. And so we build tools and APIs. Um, we launched an API last year. Um, if you check out our developer page, developer.digitalglobe.com, we have a free tier. So if you're a developer, you can start off free using Digital Globe imagery through an easy to use API, and we partnered with Mapbox on that. Um, we are licensing our content. Um, we're a data licensor. The way I explain it to my mother is, it's like Pixar licensing a film. Uh, people go and pay money to watch that film, and there's a value exchange there. So we're licensing content much like the music industry, or video game industry. I know it's not the sexiest thing in the world. Uh, some people do find it very interesting, um, but it's our business model. That's how we make money. Um, we, we are licensing data to the government. We are licensing data to uh, companies such as these. Many of them are in the room. Um, Mapbox and Microsoft, for, as an example, license our content and then publish it into ID Editor and JAWSM and all the tools we use and that's where you're getting imagery from. Just making sure I didn't accidentally turn off my mic. Um, so if you meet someone from Mapbox or Microsoft today, buy them a coffee and shake their hand uh, because that's how we as editors of OpenStreetMap get access to a world full of satellite imagery. Um, they're paying us fees, we take that money and we build more satellites. Um, and I'm gonna show you what that looks like in real life. The reason we do this is satellites have a short lifespan. Um, mission life of about seven or eight years, we can usually extend that by a few years. Uh, we have three satellites that have been up in space for almost a decade that we will decommission at some point, so we're building new satellites to replenish. If we don't do this, 
there's no more imagery. Um, I know there's more than one imagery source out there, and I'll talk about that in a second. Um, there's always exceptions to the rule, though, um, or exceptions to our model. And for those who have volunteered with Humanitarian OpenStreetMap, you'll know that since the earthquake in Haiti, we've been providing data openly in, in times of crisis. Um, or you might have volunteered during Nepal. Dale mentioned there was 8,000 volunteers. So we make our data open in times of need when people uh, need help, uh, relief organizations. So uh, we are trying to standardize this. It's been very reactive. Um, in Ecuador, um, this past year, we license our data under Creative Commons Zero, fully public, um, which has never, as I understand, never been done by a, a company who licensed content for a business. We made it Creative Commons Zero. Uh, people seem to like that. Uh, we got great feedback. Thank you for getting that joke. Thank you for getting the licensing joke. Okay, so in real life, this is the stock exchange. I was there a couple Christmases ago, um, saw where they actually trade our, it's a weird place, but I took that image. That's why there's not a photo credit on the bottom. Uh, this is Worldview 4. Um, this is our sa newest satellite we've built. It's taken us years to build it. It's in Sunnyvale right now. It's gonna take a trip to Vandenberg Air Force Base and be launched into space. It's the culmination of years and years of work. Uh, as you probably noticed, uh, this is not a small sat. Um, there's a few clues in this image to give you a sense of scale. This is a big satellite. Uh, this is what a launch looks like. This was Worldview 3, launched two years ago from Vandenberg Air Force Base. What you're seeing here is the most dangerous part of a satellite's life. Um, space is a very quiet and uh, stable place. This is a very unstable event with acoustics, vibration, noise, a few hundred kilograms of rocket fuel sitting underneath. So we will be doing this in, I think, 55 days in uh, se uh, September 15th, and we'll be launching that satellite I just uh, showed you a picture of. So once, and by the way, this is on YouTube, this is my video as well. I hear a lot of people screaming and yelling. It's, it's cool if you had the audio. Um, once satellites get up into space, this is what our orbits look like. This is not a simulation, this is not marketing. These are actually the ground tracks of our satellite today. If you look up in the top, you'll see today's date. Uh, these are sun synchronous orbits. So they come over the North Pole, head to the South Pole. We do about 15 orbits a day and the Earth rotates underneath so we'd see the entire world. Uh, you'll see that three satellites are all kind of lined up here and they're, almost, they're over Colorado, now Utah, and they're coming to Seattle. And actually, if you watch the time, they're right above us right now, taking a shot. Um, there's one way off in the East Coast. Uh, she used to be lined up with the other ones. We moved her to an afternoon orbit. So you'll see it's afternoon in New York City right now. It's taking a shot. It took us two years to do this and a couple thousand dollars of hydrazine fuel to move it over. So despite what you see in the movies, you can't just send a command up to a satellite and move it to a different orbit. It took us two years to do that. What that does is gives us more coverage. We can see cities in the morning and then in the afternoon. By the way, um, if you come to our workshop tomorrow, um, since it's sunny today in Seattle and tomorrow, which is rare, we're gonna try to do a selfie from space tomorrow. So come to our workshop. James is gonna entertain you. James, raise your hand. He's very excited to entertain everyone and then go outside and take a shot from space. And tomorrow time, you need to wear your orange vest so we can see the spectral signature of your vest. All right, thank you. This is what a ground station looks like. We have them all over the world. This is how we downlink information. Um, images don't just come down as uh, raster geotiff, so we have to process them into this, and this is what you're used to seeing. Um, another example here. Um, our satellites have gyros on them, so we can actually angle our satellites and look at in, in different, uh, what we call off-nader angle. Some people might call it an oblique. Um, so you're seeing the, the facades of buildings here. Um, here's an extreme example, and this one's for Ben Grant. Um, this was Manhattan, we shot it earlier in the year. Uh, you might be saying, oh, I've seen that shot a million times, but you've probably never seen it taken from 500 kilometers south east of Bermuda. So we're, yeah, we're in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. Instead of taking pictures of water, we angle our satellites back and take really awesome pictures of, of cities, like you're seeing here. And even at that very extreme angle, the resolution of this image is about one meter per pixel. 
Uh, Mount Kilimanjaro, same concept. Uh, Mount Rushmore from a few weeks ago. Seattle, Seattle University, we're sitting right here. And this is what, as OpenStreetMap editors, we're used to seeing images like this, right? ID editor, JAWSM, uh, Ecuador. So this is the whole model. Um, I've kind of just given you the like five minute or seven minute overview of how we as a business are sustainable, how we um, are able to launch more satellites and how you as editors get access to imagery. So that's the model. And as I was doing this, I was like, well, there's tons of sources of imagery, right? Um, there's aerial companies as well, like Wolpert, Surdex, Sanborn, uh, UAV startups. They're doing something very similar where they're flying aircraft and they're licensing data. Most of them are, are privately held, so it's a slightly different business model. Uh, we all love Landsat. Um, this is a government model. Uh, what, there was a hearing uh, a few weeks, or probably a couple months ago now, where a representative from NASA said, well, it's not like the, data's, the data are free. Uh, it's just that we don't make you pay for it twice. So if you're a taxpayer in the United States, we've paid for Landsat. Um, and they don't make us, they don't charge us twice. So it's, it's not really free, it's open, but we're paying for it. Those satellites cost over a billion dollars each, so we're paying for it. Um, there's a ton of sat, uh, satellite startups uh, that are venture capital backed. Uh, different model than ours. We're a public company, they're venture capital backed. Their business model is TBD. They're experimenting, we wish them well. We actually, as Digital Globe, people think, oh, you know, we're the incumbents and we're gonna get disrupted by all these disruptors. We're fine with that. We need more commercial companies up in space. Um, it shows that it's a viable medium uh, and government, <laughs> it's not like they're doubling NASA budgets every year, they're trying to cut back. So we need more commercial companies up in space and actually we're working with these startups to see how our, our technology complements each other. It's not the same. Um, this is resolution. So our resolution's in the sub 50 centimeter, NASA's 15 meter, Planet Labs is three to five meter. Um, and accuracy, our satellites are very accurate. When you have a big platform, it gives you a stable uh, base to, to achieve accuracy. That's really important for those who have played with the imagery offset tool. Um, we're at three meters now, we're driving that down to a meter. Um, that's, I don't need to overstate it, but that's very important when it comes to, to mapping. And, and one of the challenges with UAVs um, and with microsats is they're not very stable. So um, they're drifting and the, uh, sometimes you get 20 meter or, or 100 meter inaccuracy. Or I guess it's accuracy, but I call it inaccuracy. Um, so here's a scale model of what this looks like. Um, where you see a person there, there's what, uh, how big a uh, Planet Lab satellite is all the way through Worldview 2. Uh, we're using the latest in software and technology to minimize our, our software footprint. Reason why our satellites are big um, is m mainly because of physics, um, right? Uh, physics, uh, as far as we know, uh, physics are a constant in our galaxy. In other galaxies, physics might be different. So smaller satellites might perform differently in other galaxies, but as far as we know, um, in this galaxy, they perform in a certain way, and I'll show you the equation here coming up. Also happens, uh, there's a lot of debris in space. Uh, last week we had an incident where one of our satellites absorbed some debris. Um, it turns out having a big satellite is good for that event, because we were able, to, the incident happened in the morning, we collected this image in the afternoon and tweeted it out. So our satellite's doing fine, but it did take an impact. All right, the formula for resolution is not a secret. Uh, it's very simple. You want, if you want high resolution, you want a small number on the left. So you want a low number in the numerator and a, a, a small number, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, a big number in the uh, denominator. Sorry, I got distracted by the five minutes thing. All right, so this is what it looks like, low Earth orbit. You have the space station. Um, they have a 400 millimeter focal length Nikon lens up there that's like a $10,000 lens. They're taking shots. That's Landsat at 700 kilometer orbit with a focal length of about um, one meter. Worldview 3 has a 16 meter 
uh, focal length. If you have any, if any of you are photographers, 16 meter focal length would blow your mind if you use it on Earth. Uh, to give you an example, if you if you were to take a picture from the Hollywood sign in California or in Los Angeles, you could see a beach ball on the Golden Gate Bridge with that type of focal length. Taking out the curvature of the Earth and terrain, that's what kind of uh, resolution we're talking about here. And then you have a dove and uh, an airplane, for, just for scale. So this is what it looks like. This is a shot from the ISS of Vancouver. Um, you zoom in and it starts to get grainy. This is what we do as mappers, we always want to zoom in, right? This is Landsat, zoom in, it gets grainy. We're like, oh dang, that's not gonna work. Bring in Planet Labs, it gets better, right? Zoom in, still a little bit grainy. This is what a digital globe satellite looks like and you can even zoom in further and see markings on the ground. That's what this is all about is extracting information from imagery to do our mapping. And that little sequence I just showed you, that's how technology and the satellite world can work together. I just showed you the zoom in and I showed you the difference between what a Landsat resolution versus Planet Labs versus Digital Globe. So actually I think um, these technologies are very complementary, not, not competitive, despite the marketing campaigns of some of our friends. So this is where I kind of finish off and I'm gonna set up Anand uh, on, on his presentation. Imagery is great, but we look at these uh, as data sets, not just imagery. Um, so we're running algorithms. This is um, actually, this kind of is like Dale's presentation from the keynote this morning. This is building materials that we've automatically extracted from non-visible wavelengths in our satellite. We're collecting RGB plus 16 other non-visible wavelengths. So we can actually detect building materials. Um, we can detect the health of forests. Uh, this is an infrared image. Red means things are good, brown means things are bad. This could have been a fire, this could have been a beetle infestation. Uh, these are the type of things we're trying to deliver answers. This one, I'm sorry I don't have the key on this. I, was, I actually pulled it, but then in the last few weeks I've been marking trees in OpenStreetMap, and I don't know who's marked trees in OpenStreetMap, but uh, it's almost mind numbing. So there's a lot of trees in the world, so let's throw an algorithm against it and at least get a baseline of all the trees and we can go and clean it up. Um, we're looking for land parcels and swimming pools. This is a project we're doing in Australia um, where we're trying to identify every home in Australia with a swimming pool. And the government's interested in that to make sure people are maintaining their swimming pools and not creating like mosquito infestations. Um, change. Here's another way of looking at change. This is uh, Cupertino, California over the last six years. This is the campus. Um, it's really interesting. Uh, we can detect this from algorithms, and this is just a visual way of showing you the last six years, seven years in Cupertino. Um, our, our, the purpose of our company is seeing a better world. So this is actually a campaign we're running right now to count, using a crowd, count seals in Antarctica. Anyone's free to join this? Um, and this is what seals look like in our imagery. Uh, and so feel free to go to tomnod.com and check that out. But again, we are it's not just the imagery of Antarctica, it's what are the information, what are the critical insights we can take from that and actually learn something. So in closing, um, this is a credit, Dale had this in his slide but did not properly credit Charlie Lloyd, so I'm calling you out Dale, wherever you are. This is Charlie, he works at Mapbox, he put this together, it's from a Japanese weather satellite called Himawari. Um, I, the reason I like this, I'm gonna play it again. I'll, I'll try to play it again. There we go. Um, when you look at the world today, it's a crazy, chaotic, violent, messed up. I mean, we live in the US, we, we've seen the politics. Humans are doing the best we can to, to ruin this planet. When you look at it from space, it's the opposite. It's quiet, it's obviously it's quiet because sound doesn't propagate in space, but it's very pristine. <laughs> Thank you for getting that joke as well. Uh, the Earth is beautiful from space, and you don't see all the noise that we're creating. It's simple, um, and it's beautiful. And I actually, OpenStreetMap to me is an abstraction of that image. It's an abstraction of how we see the Earth from space and it, in its beauty, and all the things we've built on the ground, and all the features that the Earth has, and it's a, an abstraction of that. So for me, uh, OpenStreetMap's been very therapeutic. Um, and together, I think we're building something amazing. Um, and it's great to see new people out here. It's great to see the community. Um, I've 
been doing OSM for about five years, back when it was like a hobby, and everyone said, oh, it's pff, nice little hippie pet project, it's not gonna work. Now it's real. All right, so thank you for everything you do, and thank you for coming to my presentation. I'll take some questions. Hi, great presentation. Thank um, you. Thanks. Um, so I work in a lot of areas where there's little to no data in OpenStreetMap, and there is no high-res imagery for them, and because they're away from urban centers, and there's not much motivation across the kind of commercial um, companies involved to get imagery. So have you any ideas about how we could solve that problem? Uh, great question. Uh, you're absolutely right. Um, we can solve that problem. In Digital Globe, we've mapped every square meter of the entire world at high res. That data is available, and I'll tell you right now, we're working with several entities, some may or may not be in this room, to provide even more imagery to OpenStreetMap beyond what's available in Bing Maps and, satellite, and Mapbox Satellite. So we've collected the data, and it's just a matter of us finding the right distribution to get it to everyone. But we have the entire world mapped at high res. So the data's there, we just need to figure out how to connect the dots to the end users. Um, follow Digital Globe, uh, social media, whatever, follow me, because um, in the next few months we'll have some exciting news about that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Mike Thompson. Okay, and just so everyone, Mike was basically saying, um, well, let me put it differently. We've been operating satellites for 15 years. Um, we, actually more than that, 17, we, we launched Iconos in 1999. Um, some of you were probably born in 1999, I'm guessing. So we've been operating, we, we basically have this time series we can go back into, and this archive I mentioned of 80 petabytes. Um, we, had, we had a scientist come in who's measuring you can look him up, extreme ice surveys, he's measuring the glacial retreat, and he's like, listen, glaciers and ice are gonna be non-existent in 100 years, and what you have is a diary of a resource that's disappearing. And so that's just a different example, but we do actually have depth in our archive. If you looked at a city like Seattle, we probably have a 1,000 images of Seattle over the last 17 years. And so to go back in time, so to speak, and see the changes over time, um, and, and see the differences between the imagery, uh, that's something we can solve. So kind of like the, the other question, we can solve it. We just need to figure out how to do it. Uh, whoa, that's loud. <laughs> a couple years ago, uh, law was changed to allow uh, higher resolution imagery to be distributed. Yeah. And I think Digital Globe just like immediately switched, started distributing yeah. that higher resolution imagery. Um, is it legal now caught up with the technical? No. Uh, no, no, so we're licensed through NOAA, um, and we are, you can read this, we are continually putting pressure on NOAA to give us more relaxation in what we can distribute. What you're referring to is um, in 2013 and 2014, we could only distribute 50 centimeter imagery, nothing below. We started building Worldview 3 in 2010 with a capability to do 30 centimeter. So we, we bef four years before the policy change, we started building the technology to do something better than we are actually licensed to do. Um, and to give you an example, uh, we're collecting shortwave infrared imagery that were restricted to 7.5 meters, but we can actually collect it much higher resolution. So we're continuing to put pressure on NOAA and the United States government to allow us to do more higher technology um, distribution of, of what we're able to collect. So today it's at 25 centimeter, that cap for uh, RGB imagery. Um, we're looking ahead and we wanna build satellites that will do better than 25 centimeters. 
Um, but we need help from NOAA to, to let us distribute that. We're regular, orbits are regulated by the US government. I think I have time for one more. Uh, Kevin? Yes. Uh, Clifford Snow here. Oh, hi, Clifford. Hey, thank you very much for coming, and thank you very much for the workshop we're going to have tomorrow. Yes. I'm looking forward to that. Okay. Um, question on, on Bing, on JASM, I can get the date when the image was taken. Yep. On Mapbox, I can't. It would really help because sometimes I have no idea if that's a new or old building. Sure. Can we fix that? Uh, yeah, we can fix that. Um, every, every image we take has about 100 lines of metadata from the accuracy of that image to the exact millisecond when it was taken. So the metadata is there and it's just a matter of propagating it into the end tools. I, I totally agree, not knowing when an image was taken is very frustrating. Am I looking at an image from last week or from six years ago? So uh, I know the Mapbox team is here. Uh, we, can, we can work, Alex is here and a few others. They have, they have the metadata and it's just a matter of enhancing the tools. Yeah, no. no. <laughs> I, well, Alex, I'll, I'm gonna give credit to Alex. I, I presented in Birmingham a few years ago and talked about um, our satellite imagery and you said, when's it gonna be available for OSM? That was the question I got and we did it months after, after you asked that question. So Alex has helped propagate imagery into OSM, and I know a Mapbox team can, can do even more in terms of the metadata. So thank you, Alex. And thank you, Kevin. All right, thank you.